Okay, so now let's derive the algorithm for the dot product to be correct. We're going to do this for alpha becomes x transpose y plus alpha. What we're going to do is we're going to fill out a worksheet for computing the operation, which is up here. And in this worksheet, dark colored boxes are going to be part of the proof of correctness. And actually, this should have been a dark colored box. And what's in the white boxes are the executable statements in the algorithm. How are we going to do this? Well, we have this worksheet. What is our worksheet? It's something that structures the derivation of the algorithm hand-to-hand -hand with the proof of its correctness. Here it is. It's empty, except that we have stated up here what we want the algorithm to compute. And again, dark colored boxes are going to be for assertions about what must be true at that point in the algorithm. The white boxes are going to be part of the algorithm. So the first thing we do is we say, OK, this is the operation that we wish to compute. We're going to say that before we get started, alpha contains its original contents. And then we're going to state that when we're all done, alpha must contain the result of taking the dot product of x and y, add it to its original contents. And the way we fill that in in the worksheet is that we state at the top that alpha contains its original contents. And at the bottom, we state that alpha must contain x transpose y plus its original contents. Here comes the important part. What we want to do is we want to come up with this loop invariant. The loop invariant is the statement that allows us to invoke the principle of mathematical induction. It tells us what is in alpha as the loop executes. The way we're going to get that is we're going to say, well, the one thing we know about x and y is that we're going to systematically march through it partitioning the vectors x and y into a top part and a bottom part. Now what we can do is we can take the result of this partitioning and we can plug it into our post condition. And when we do that, we get this result right here. Okay, now in week one, when we talked about slicing and dicing, we made a point of noting that if you, have a, if you have two vectors that have been partitioned and you take, yep, this needs to be gone, and you take their dot product, what you get is the dot product of the first two vectors added to the dot product of the second two vectors. It's something we learned in week one. This gives us something that we call the partitioned partitioned matrix expression. This tells us everything that must be computed when we're done, but states it in terms of these partitioned vectors that we naturally encounter as the algorithm executes. If you think about it, the contents of alpha, as the loop still executes, can't be the complete result of the computation. So inherently, as the loop executes, only part of the total computation will have been performed. So the way we're going to come up with a statement about what should be in alpha as the loop executes is we're going to say, well, it's not all of the computation, so we'll scratch something out, and I'm just going to scratch this out. And this then leaves us with a partial result towards the total computation. And that we call the loop invariant. So notice that I came up with this loop invariant from knowing how to compute the operation 
and how I want to partition vectors x and y. So then we take that loop invariant and we plug it into our worksheet. And notice that we don't have an algorithm. What we know is that we want to establish the base case for our principle of mathematical induction. So before the loop starts, we want it to be the case that alpha contains this. We then want this to be true at the top of the loop. We want to fill out our body of our loop in such a way that it will again be true at the bottom of the loop. What do we know then? Well, we know it's true before the loop. Therefore, it's going to be true the first time we get into the loop. If we know that it's true the first time into the loop, and we know that if it's true here at the top of the loop, then it will again be true at the bottom of the loop, then we know after this loop executes the first time, it's true at the bottom of the loop. But no computation happens between here and here. Therefore, it will again be true at the top of the loop the next time the loop executes. We know that if it's true at the top of the loop the next time it executes, it will again be true at the bottom of the loop, and so forth. So what does that mean? Every time through the loop, it will be true here and here. But eventually, we're going to get out of the loop. Actually, we don't know this yet, but some condition will get us out of the loop. We will then know that it's also true when we come out of the loop because no computation happens between it being true at the bottom of the loop, us noticing that we need to get out of the loop, and then ending up at this place in the algorithm. And if we can then show that this state right here implies this state right here, then we know we have computed the correct result. Okay, so now we need to fill out the rest of the worksheet to make this all happen. How do we do that? Well, we're going to determine the loop guard. Now here I've sort of homed in on part of the worksheet. We know that we want when we come out of the loop for the loop invariant to be true. We also know that whatever condition keeps us in the loop is no longer true when we come out of the loop. So this guides us now to pick the condition that keeps us in the loop in such a way that this being true implies this being true. Well, on the what condition is this the same as that? It's the same if x top is all of x and y top is all of y. So here we can put in the condition that x top is not yet the same size as x as the condition that keeps us in the loop, so that when we come out of the loop, the condition is that the size of x top is equal to the size of x, which means x top is x, since we're marching through y in the same way, a y top will be all of y, and therefore the loop invariant will imply that we've computed the right thing. So notice that by looking at the loop invariant and looking at the post condition, we can determine what the loop guard, the condition that keeps us in the loop, must be. So we fill that in in the worksheet, and that then ends up right here. And notice that we then know that here the loop guard is true, because after all we got back into the loop, and we know that it's false when we come out of the loop. So then we move on. We try to determine how to initialize. Well, what do we know? We know that we want to be in a state where the loop invariant is true. We know that a alpha, we know that alpha is originally equal to its original contents. Okay? And we know that we want to march through vectors x and y. So the question is, how do we need to march through vectors x and y? Well, we know that we want to partition vectors x and y, but it's only the case that this condition implies that condition if x top and y top have no entries, so that x top, y top is zero. So notice that the precondition, together with the loop invariant, now dictates how we must initialize our partitionings of x and y. Okay, and we fill that into the worksheet. Slowly, 
we're starting to fill out the worksheet. Next, we know that we must march through the vectors. And we know that initially, x top is empty. And find, in the end, x top must be all of x. Therefore, we know that we should take elements from the bottom part and add them to the top part as the algorithm proceeds. And we fill that in to our worksheet. So here we're homing in on the top of the loop. What we now know is that the loop invariant is true here. We know that we're repartitioning our vectors x and y. Notice that that doesn't involve any computation. That's just an indexing step. That's just slicing and dicing. But notice that x top is simply renamed x0 and y top is simply renamed y0. So we can replace x top and y top with x0 and y0 in this expression. And that way we find out what must be true right here. Okay, that's summarized right here. We know that this is true because that's true at the top of the loop. We know that x top is just x0 and y top is just y0. Therefore, after we do our slicing and dicing there, we know that alpha is equal to x0 transpose y0 plus alpha hat. And that shows up right there. And if you plugged it into the worksheet, that shows up right here. The loop invariant being true here, together with the kind of slicing and dicing that we do, tells us what alpha must contain in terms of the subvectors that we expose right here. Now we can go to the bottom of the loop, and we know that the loop invariant must again be true, but we also know that x top has been redefined by having an extra element, and y top has been redefined by having an extra element. So we can take that, plug it in for x top, take this, plug it in for y top, and then we know what must be in alpha at the bottom of the loop. Okay. <clears throat> now, we know that x top becomes x0 chi, zero, chi 1. We know that y top becomes y0 psi 1. Okay. When we learned about slicing and dicing the dot product, we learned that x0 chi 1 inner product with y0 psi 1 is just this right here. And therefore, we know that this must be true right here. Okay, so how we move forward together with what must be true at the bottom of the loop now dictates exactly what must be an alpha in terms of the exposed subvectors and elements in our vectors x and y. We take that and we plug it into our worksheet. Now, the worksheet is completely filled in except for the part where we need to determine how to update alpha. But notice that alpha contains this Alpha contains this at this point in our algorithm. It must contain this at this point in our algorithm. The difference is that alpha must have an extra term added to it. And therefore, we know that the update that must happen is that alpha becomes alpha plus chi 1 times psi 1. All we then have to do is get rid of all of the gray boxes that had to do with the proof of correctness. And we're left with the correct algorithm, which we derived hand in hand with its proof of correctness. This hopefully gives you some idea of number one, how the principle of mathematical induction is related to proving loops correct or deriving them to be correct. And number two, the fact that this vision of goal-oriented programming that Dijkstra had in the early 1970s, uh, we can actually already achieve with what you have learned in the class, except you probably need to know a little bit about logic along the way, and some of you may not have seen that yet. So, in the end, what do we conclude? Well, we, con we conclude that Dijkstra may have been right. 
one can derive loop-based algorithms hand-in-hand with their proof of correctness.